arms races are a funny thing. Especially when there are artificially imposed or agreed upon nuances like limitations of strategic arsenals. The issue is, inevitably, someone will step the line and continue to push until all semblance of power is gone, and thus every other state must follow, a risk becoming past tense. In times of crisis, nations frequently take the road of arming rapidly as is economically feasible or borrowing against their industrial base to make it happen all the sooner. The slow boiling rise of tensions as always manifests in the predictable ways in the inner sphere. Undeclared border skirmishes escalating to brush wars. It was a time of vast proliferation and the Star League couldn't be everywhere all at once. At the dawn of 2765, humanity was barely three months away from the most appalling war in its history. To help us cover the coming conflict and better understand the sheer scale of the war, this chapter is dedicated to examining the strength and deployments of the various militaries. Through the records of the day, we can paint a picture of the Inner Sphere as it was in the year 2765, and in so doing, explain why it was that war had become an inevitability. When the Star League was first founded in the 26th century, the reunification war that followed resulted in over a hundred million deaths. Two centuries later, the armies that were gearing up to fight were more than five times the size of those that had fought back then. Indeed, the Star League Defense Force was the largest military ever put together, with thousands of regiments and warships at its disposal. There is no better place to start our overview than with the colossal Star League Defense Force itself, which at the war's outset was helmed by Commanding General Alexander Kerensky. The SLDF had two branches, the Regular Army for ground operations and the Navy for space combat. Aerospace assets were found in both, either operating independently or integrated into another unit. The rare blue water ships were found in the specialized Can Marine regiments within the Regular Army, so named for their ability to deploy with cavalry, armored, aerospace and naval assets. The SLDF from 2575 that had seen combat during the Reunification War had a little over 500 warships and around 270 regiments. By 2765, those numbers had exploded to around 2,250 warships and an incredible 4,300 regiments, around 2,000 of which were battlement commands. Control of such a vast military was well beyond the abilities of a single man, instead falling to the Star League High Command. Kerensky and his deputy commanding general, Aaron de Chevalier, headed this group of three dozen senior generals and admirals. Under them were the SLDF Chief of Staff, Tomohiro Musuiba, and the directors of the four operational commands, Andreas Obakwelu III of Regular Army Command on New Earth, Joan Brandt of Naval Command aboard Columbus Station orbiting Mars, Koji Telasco of Special Forces Command, and Tamerlane Stephenson of Royal Command, both based on Terra. The heads of each military region filled out the rest of the High Command, with additional input from the Logistical and Support Command directors. The organization of the SLDF retained its multiples of three format, as did the militaries of all other states, but from a division level on up, this rigid structure no longer applied. At the absolute top level were the ten army groups, one for each nation within the Star League. These were named for the ruling Great House in that region, for example, Army Group Cameron and Army Group Marek. Each was helmed by a senior general who were most often political appointments, as their main job was to represent the SLDF within their assigned state. The composition of the army groups were far from uniform and varied significantly in size. One step down was the army, building blocks of the larger army groups. The SLDF had a total of 20 armies which were split unequally across the Star League. The associate members out in the periphery each had a single army assigned to keep the peace, as did the Terran hegemony. The other five member states had a trio of armies to keep them in line. The makeup of the armies reflected the type of conflict that they might be expected to face. Those out in the periphery and in the more provincial free worlds stressed maneuverability, whereas others had a more standard form. The smallest were found in the smallest nation, the Capellan Confederation, and fielded around 140 regiments each, whereas the largest were posted to the belligerent Traconis Combine, some numbering as high as 325 regiments. The soldiers of the Star League Defense Force, SLDF, are revered in modern times as knights in shining armor. But it's often forgotten that in their day, they existed to enforce the will of the First Lord on nations and populations that weren't always in favor of the Star League. One look at a deployment map from 2765 
reveals that the SLDF was very much an army of occupation from the perspective of those who chafed under the control of a foreign government. The 12 corps that had been around in Ian Cameron's day expanded into the first 11 armies, bringing much of their unit histories and commendations with them, though some of their heritage would transfer to the new units that would replace them. The Star Guard was the sole exception, which was rolled into First Army. In the era of Kerensky, there were 72 individual corps. Each army was allocated three or four of them, while each corps fielded between four and nine divisions. The divisions themselves were the standard fighting unit for the SLDF, consisting of three brigades which were deployed together to wage a single battle. Divisions were classified as either battle mech or one of several types of infantry unit. Every type of division had at least one battle mech and one infantry brigade, with the third being the deciding factor on how the overall unit was classified. The equipment available to the infantry assets would determine whether it was mechanized, jump or just grunt infantry, but this designation didn't always reflect the abilities of the individual regiments within. This format did create certain weaknesses that would soon become apparent in the coming chaos. Because the brigades were so interdependent, losing one key link in their operation could leave large chunks of their strength stranded without transport or without orders, creating cascading problems for others within the division. Therefore, while they might have been unstoppable in a pitched battle, they were vulnerable when things got ugly. Individual brigades were almost never dispatched on the offensive because of this. The SLDF was aware of this potential problem and had a solution, the independent regiments. These were most often assigned at a core level and could, as the name suggests, operate independently on extended missions or maneuvers with their own support network and permanently assigned transport. Those armies who were geared towards flexibility, like those in the periphery, had an increased complement to these. They were most often assigned to smaller scale hotspots, or if part of a larger operation alongside a conventional division, to flank or exploit weak points in the enemy's line. Occasionally, armies would be assigned several of these units grouped together into regimental combat teams, which would either be entrusted to a core or split between them to be recalled and regrouped if needed. Many speak of the beginning of the reunification war as the end of peace. Do you consider that, in truth, the grand experiment that was the Star League was born out of strife? It's peace paid for by the blood of billions. The collaboration and unification of the great houses under the banner of the Star League was, in part, achieved at the cost of many. From the innocents on all sides caught in the middle, by the soldiers and sailors of the various combatant factions, and by the periphery states whose only wish was to be left below. General Amalthea Kincaid's legacy of reformations lived on into 2765. Whereas at one point the SLDF had fought as a combined arms military, even down to a battalion level, the SLDF that Kerensky led now fielded entire brigades that were exclusively one category of unit, whether infantry, armor, or battle mech. This was true of regiments as well, almost without exception. One quirk of the regular army that is most unusual by today's standards is the uniformity of their war assets. Each lance was composed of four of the same mech, vehicle, or aerospace fighter. This was commonly true of whole companies and occasionally even entire battalions. In very rare instances, a regiment could be entirely outfitted with just one type of unit, such as the 3286th Heavy Assault stationed on Taurus, which could field 108 stalker mechs. Like the rigidity inherent in the deployment of divisions, this gave them great strength and specialization when fighting together, but left them vulnerable if a part was missing. As well as the units themselves, the SLDF relied on extensive and widespread use of fortifications across the entire Star League. These ranged from the more conventional forts up to the extremely elaborate Castles Brian, some of which dated back almost 400 years to before even the Age of War. The Terran hegemony was bordered by a ring of these imposing emplacements known as the Home Circle. A less defined circle existed at roughly 250 light years from Terra, and a third along the border and within the periphery. Castles Brian were designed to be almost unassailable bastions, able to withstand orbital bombardment and even nuclear strikes. Nor could they be ignored by an invader, as the many hidden entrances would allow the occupier to launch sorties into the attacker's rear areas. More than a hundred of these were scattered across the hegemony, the highest concentration being the 20 installations on Earth. The best known SLDF complex is of course the Citadel. While not a Castle Brian itself, it boasted many of the same features and served as High Command's base of operations. 
Located just outside Unity City, the unofficial name for the court of the Star League, but often used to refer to the wider metropolitan area, the Citadel was all but impregnable. In addition to the more obvious defences, secret bases were constructed within the member and territorial states from which counterattacks could be launched should any ever try to break from the Star League, such as the Damocles contingency aimed at the Free Worlds. Two of the more famous include the Nagayan Mountain Complex on Helm and Camelot Command within the Dark Nebula. Sadly, centuries of searching and exploration by treasure hunters have concluded that both were lost during the ensuing wars. Last, but certainly not least, the space defence systems still operated within the hegemony, though Simon Cameron had put a stop to their further development and proliferation. Of the dozen or so designs that had been trialled over the years, four naval vessels had entered mass production. In addition to the components in space, large emplacements built onto the surface of the planets, moons or asteroids added considerable strength to the defences. The most basic naval element was the M3 drone. All of the space that a dropship might normally have dedicated to sustaining a crew was instead housing more arms and armour. Mistaking one of these drones for a mere assault dropship could cost a vessel its life, as in truth they packed as much firepower as a small corvette. When too heavily damaged to continue fighting, these drones would plot collision courses with the enemy ships, a trait shared with their larger brethren. It's often mistakenly believed that the drones were completely autonomous, but in reality there was a small team of officers directing the operations of every SDS. Oftentimes these were located on the ground, but others controlled things from Howder command ships. Each station could manage between a few dozen and a few hundred drones depending on the size of the computer within. The most sophisticated of these was the Advanced Tactical Analysis Computer, which could coordinate ship actions far faster than its human counterparts. Possessing the digitized strategic minds of several noteworthy admirals, they had a frightening intelligence during naval encounters. The next step up was the M5 Capital Drone, more commonly known as the Casper. Equivalent in size to the Lola class destroyer on which they were based, they were actually closer to battleships in terms of weapons load. Most every planet in the hegemony had at least a couple floating somewhere in the system, ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. The largest and most daunting of all was the M9 Battle Station, better known as the Pavese. These two kilometre long juggernauts were matched in size by only the absolute top of the Star League Navy. Primarily support vessels for the other drones, a Pavese could repair and rearm any damaged SDS ship without the need for a human technical crew. They carried a complement of over a hundred Voidseeker aerospace fighter drones and a weapons payload more devastating than even the top of the line Mechanic class warship. All this came at a cost of virtual immobility. Its comparatively diminutive engines meant it fought without the mind-bending manoeuvres of its smaller counterparts. The biggest issue facing the SLDF in 2765, other than a periphery on the brink of all-out war, was inter-service factionalism. When the Star League was first founded, one of the challenges was getting the new recruits from the many different nations to come together and put aside their past differences. Thanks to the actions of commanding generals Norof Cameron and Lee, this had largely been accomplished by the end of the 26th century. 150 years later, the problem was the inverse. The royal units from within the Terran hegemony had always been entrusted with the first use of the most advanced technology, which over time had created a serious animosity among the rest of the SLDF. Worse, the royal command had a definite character of elitism and superiority at almost all levels. The ill will had not boiled over into violence, but there was a distinct feeling of us versus them among the divisions. The defence of the Terran hegemony military region rested with the three corps of the supremely prestigious 1st Army, the 1st, 10th and 21st, for a total of 7 battle main divisions and 16 infantry, plus 18 independent regiments. The Terran Regimental Combat Team was also assigned to 1st Army. Adding considerable strength to this seemingly small garrison, were the tens of thousands of reservists, retired soldiers and officers, and the many new recruits still in training. The baseline allocation for battle mech divisions for all member states was 18, with varying amounts of infantry divisions in support depending on the size and belligerence of the individual nation. The Federated Sons military region, for example, had 54 of these, plus 18 independent regiments for fast response, including the 4th RCT, which fittingly was assigned to the 4th Army. The Capellan Confederation military region had the fewest number of infantry divisions, at just 31. 
The 5th RCT was at the command of 7th Army for a total of 13 independent regiments altogether. The Confederation was not quite as anti-Star League as some of the other nations, but was one of the most hostile towards the actual SLDF, a resentment that came from their perceived lack of support during the border war. The Free Worlds League military region had 40 infantry divisions, plus an enormous 63 independent regiments. With most of the FWLM clustered within the provinces, the independent worlds were particularly exposed to banditry, and required a larger contingent of quick response troops. The Lyran Commonwealth military region fielded 44 infantry divisions and 27 independents. 12th Army was assigned the understrength 2nd RCT, which had recently taken a beating on the Torian world of Detroit. Ambushed by a full division of rebel militia, three whole SLDF regiments were destroyed in a nuclear strike and ensuing battle. Only the 25th Striker was able to escape. The Draconis Combine military region warranted by far the largest contingent of SLDF troops of any member state, chiefly because they were the sole nation involved in all three of the hidden wars. While tensions between them had actually quietened and weren't as overtly hostile as the Free Worlds or Capellans, or especially the periphery, the Combine mech warriors still continued to engage in dueling which stretched that relationship. The three armies in this region had seven battle mech divisions each, plus another 81 infantry divisions altogether. 36 independent regiments were dispersed across the realm, including the 3rd RCT assigned to 16th Army. The four armies assigned to the territorial states had a standard complement of 6 battle mech divisions, 15 infantry divisions and 30 independent regiments. The only exception to this was 20th Army, with one additional battle mech unit. The 20th had begun withdrawing from the Rimworlds in 2757, but had delayed moving to their next berth in the Outworlds for almost a decade. In 2765, they were dispersed across the coreward side of the Inner Sphere. Officially, there were no RCTs deployed in the periphery, but a handful of corps had created their own ad hoc equivalents. The 46th operated their independence in three loose brigades, the 47th grouped eight of their ten regiments into teams Castor and Pollux, while the 48th fielded task forces Sagittarius, Hippocampus and Aegis. Supporting the regular army were the 20 fleets of the Star League Navy. At one time envisioned to work hand in hand with their matching army, former commanding admiral David Peterson was able to free them from this previously restrictive deployment, and the navy now operated independently. Each fleet had between three and five squadrons, save first fleet which had seven. All this added up to a total of 1,500 warships. The first and second were dedicated command fleets which spent most of their time either at the front or in the heart of the Star League. Five of their squadrons were specially outfitted with Mechanic-class command ships. Together, they would form the Star League Emergency Command Post, a network of warships from which the entire SLDF could be operated in the unthinkable event that the Citadel was in some way destroyed. The First Lord, Commanding General and High Command were each assigned a vessel, the SLS Star League, McKenna's Pride and Enterprise, with the two reserve vessels from Second Fleet, SLS CAF and New Earth, performing additional duties as required. The Third through Twelfth Fleets were each responsible for naval operations in the Terran Hegemony, Draconis Combine, Federated Sons, Capellan Confederation, Free Worlds League, Lyran Commonwealth, Magistracy of Canopus, Outworlds Alliance, Taurian Concordat and Rimworlds respectively though the latter had left alongside the regular army. The 13th through 20th fleets were operated across borders and worked to track any hostile movements back to their sources, as well as reinforcing the more established fleets where needed. In addition to the 20 battle fleets, there was also the garrison fleet, which alone could match half of the others combined. However, it was a fleet in name only, as the 750 warships were dispersed across the entire Star League as either singles or groups of two. Lastly, as well as the over 2,000 active vessels, roughly another thousand were sitting in various states of disrepair, disassembly, or in some cases mothballed for future use. These could be brought into service if a large enough crisis emerged. After the first dreadnoughts entered service under James McKenna, warships would become a regular site within the navies of the Inner Sphere. The Star League, at its height, operated a staggering 2,000 vessels less than a quarter would survive its collapse. Today, not a single one remains. 
even a handful of ships could radically shift the balance of power between nations, so identifying and preventing any efforts to construct one remains a top priority for every intelligence agency. But with the absence of any rival fleets, and the costs involved in maintaining one enormous, it's debatable as to what they could achieve that can't be done for less. It would seem that every nation has concluded that a navy is only required if your opponent has one, and an informal status quo not to construct one has been settled upon. Warships are somewhat of a Pandora's box, and the modern-day successor states seem content not to open that can of worms. The SLDF was ultimately just one of ten militaries within the Star League, and though its power was unequaled, no one in High Command was taking that for granted. They fully understood that any of the member states could pose a serious challenge should it come to war, and this was equally true for the forces of a hypothetical combined territorial state uprising. As it transpired, none of the militaries of the five major powers would play a significant role in the coming chaos. Their time to shine would come later that century. For the sake of completeness, we'll provide a brief overview of the brigades that existed in 2765. As ever, the other militaries used their own terminology and structure, and care must be taken to prevent mistaking a comparatively insignificant SLDF infantry brigade with one of the enormous battle mech brigades of the member states, some of which were compatible to an entire SLDF corps. At the core of the AWFS were the Avalon Hussars, while the Robinson Chevaliers and Certes Fusiliers saw to the defence of the Draconis and Compellent marches. Smaller brigades included the Arcadian Quidditchers, Tancredi Loyalists, Dragon Lords, and the newly formed Seti Hussars. A large part of the recent expansion was due to John Davian's March Militia Initiative, with the Capellan, Crucis, and Draconis marches each fielding their own force. The personal guard of the ruling Great House, the Davian Brigade of Guards, is one of the most elite units within the Inner Sphere. Each of the seven commonalities within the Confederation supports their own brigade, including the Tikhonov Lancers, Chesterton Regulars, Capellan Chargers, St. Ives Armoured Cavalry, Cyan Dragoons, and the Andurian Hussars. The Sana Sabres had long since been disbanded during the Second Andurian War, and were replaced by the Liao Lancers. The Liao Guards protected the ancestral home and personal property of the ruling house, but the real elite of the Seacaf were the Capellan Hussars Brigade, which included some of the most storied and experienced in existence, some dating back to before the Confederation's founding 400 years earlier. Seven provincial brigades provided the bedrock of the FWLM's military power, the Matic Guard, Orient Hussars, Fusiliers of Orient, Regulan Hussars, Defenders of Andurian, Stuart Dragoons, and the Orlov Grenadiers. The main punch of the FWLM came from its four federal brigades. The Manic Militia, not to be mistaken with planetary militia, was one of the largest units in the Inner Sphere. The Boland defenders occupied the Boland salient jutting into the Lyran Commonwealth. The Atrian Dragoons and Freewell's guards were the fanatical elite and personal command of the Captain General. The LCAF, despite its bumbling reputation, was a military that could bring considerable power to bear. Like the Free Worlds, it has its own provincial forces, the Donegal Guards and Sky Rangers. The Tamar Pact did not have provincial troops, but instead supported the federal Arcturan Guards. The Lyran Guards was the largest battlemate brigade in the Inner Sphere, while the Lyran Regulars were a semi-permanent retirement and garrison unit. A trio of small brigades funded by local planetary governments and nobility included the Odessa and York Regulars and Hesperus Guards. Guarding the Archon himself were the four Royal Guards regiments, the elite of the Lyran Commonwealth. The Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery was the most serious contender to the SLDF. The four military districts each fielded a division of troops, the Benjamin, Galadin, Pesht and Razalhag Regulars. Three smaller commands supported them in particular hotspots, the Dayron Regulars, Arkab Legion and Proserpina Hussars. The Sunzang Kara provided the fanatical recruits from that self-same military academy battle mechs with which to get their first frontline experience. The elite of the elite were the five reinforced regiments of the Sword of Light Brigade. Over the last 150 years, most of the Inner Sphere navies had either been mothballed, scrapped, or sold off. Many pirates were now operating ancient hulks, which were no threat in a stand-up fight against modern warships, but could prey upon the undefended merchant vessels. Comparing what little was left to the mighty Star League Navy is a sad affair. 
any single SLN fleet matched or even outnumbered the entire navy of the other five member states. SLDF High Command knew that they would soon be squaring off against the periphery in what would likely be a major uprising. While the political unrest was causing them no end of problems, they thought at least that they would be on top of things should the situation transition into war. None of the former independent states of the periphery were at their pre-reunification war levels. Between them, they had just 44 battle mech and 56 conventional regiments. The SLDF was lacking one crucial piece of information though, the existence of the so-called secret army out in the deep periphery. The secret army of the Rimworld's Republic is one of the black eyes that the League would never historically heal from. How the League's intelligence agencies miss this is still something of a mystery. You could say that they had become lazy, maybe even arrogant in their position, but the failure here by the League would be felt not just by the soldiers who would end up fighting this secret army, but also the civilians who would suffer greatly by their hand. Janina Centrella had spent the last five years reversing the actions of her predecessor and gradually building up the MAF. Nine regiments had survived the reunification war, though in truth, so many battlefield losses meant it was effectively closer to three. Some, such as the Canopian Grenadiers, had been disbanded as recently as 2748. Since then, they had publicly expanded to 15 regiments, split between four brigades. The Magistracine Royal Guards were responsible for the protection of Centrella herself, and the estates of her family. The Chasseurs à Cheval had reformed three of their Canopian Light Horse regiments, and continued to be amongst the most experienced cavalry units within the Star League. The Canopian Fusiliers had expanded to four regiments and were better suited to a stand-up fight. Lastly, there were six People's Volunteers units, whose primary purpose was planetary garrison. To further support the MAF, Centrella had hired around 12 regiments worth of mercenaries, though no single unit was regimental in size. The Outworlds Alliance had begun the reunification war with only a single loosely organized mech regiment, but largely through the actions of Colonel Elias Pitcairn, had expanded to five by war's end. They had maintained those numbers since then, and like everyone, had begun expanding in 2752, now possessing a respectable 11 regiments. The Avalar Guard's duty was to protect the Avalar line, and had some of the most fanatical mech warriors within the Alliance military corps. The cream of the crop were the Alliance borderers, led by Chairman Omprakash Chern, and could always be found at the front in any major engagement. Three regional units, the Blomstein Demons, Cerberus Watch and Omferwacht Guards would frequently be in support. Three militia brigades fielded a pair of mech regiments each and took care of local defence. They were the Remora Regulars, Balagora Fusiliers and Trader Sentinels. The Torian Defence Force had suffered the worst casualties during the Reunification War. At their peak, they had maintained eight small corps plus the Torian Guard Corps and more than a dozen volunteer guard regiments. Of the almost 38 battlement regiments that had begun the fight in 2578, only 13 had lasted the duration. The Starly could ensure those numbers hadn't risen even by 2750, but just as had the other periphery realms, they too expanded to 18 mech regiments. They, along with the supporting conventional forces, were split across four corps plus the Torian Guard. The Brinton defenders were assigned to 1st Corps, the Hades Light Infantry, Guards and Cavalry filled out 2nd Corps, 3rd Corps had both the surviving Pleiades Hussars, Pleiades Lancers and Perdition Guards, 4th Corps, the four Damasus Legionnaire Regiments, and the Consolidated Torian Guard formed the foundation of their new corps alongside the Concordat Commandos and Torian Velites. The Torian Special Asteroid Support Force was an offshoot of the unique Hades Special Services that had fought among the interstellar bodies of Flanagan's Nebula during the closing days of the war. Commanded by Space Master Fern Hagley, they were a specialised element attached to the Torian Guard Corps. Of the 138 warships that had fought for the ISB in the Reunification War, just 11 had survived to the end, two for the Canopians and nine Torian vessels. By 2750, those had slightly expanded to 9 and 15 respectively, and the Outworlds Alliance had acquired its very first warships. The navies of the periphery states in 2765 were almost exclusively composed of small Pinto-class corvettes. The Canopian fleet had 20 of them, as well as the Concordat-class MCS Fury and Admiral Justin Marcus Cleave's Athena-class flagship MCS Cassandra Centrella. 
The Outworlds operates a small fleet of 15 Pintos, led by Chairman Arthur Engelman aboard OAS Pulsar. The Concord Navy is a shadow of its former self. Alongside its 18 Pintos, there is a Dart light cruiser, a Vincent Corvette, the last remaining wagon wheel class frigate, the TTS Merope, six Concordat frigates, and four Lola class destroyers. The 94 year old Marshal Amberlyn Dynes commands the 31 warships of the Concord Navy from aboard TTS Pleiades. These were the forces the Star League feared they would soon be facing, yet in reality, they were less than 20% of what was available. In the deep periphery, the secret army had expanded to a terrifying 279 battlemate regiments, supported by a further 171 regiments of conventional forces. These divisions were split between the Magistry of Canopus, who received an additional 93 battlemate regiments, the Outworlds Alliance, who got 89 new mech units, and the Torian Concordat, which took the largest portion at 97 mech regiments. The secret army required a level of commitment that only the fiercely independent periphery denizens could have met. Most considered themselves true patriots and were vehemently anti-Star League. They would have to leave behind their old lives and families and depart for training camps in the deep periphery where they eked out a meager existence, waiting for the call to return. Even the private fortunes of one of the great houses like the Amaris family wasn't enough to finance such an expansion. So where had the funding come from? Stefan had won a considerable number of development funds from the Star League itself, aimed at industrializing and expanding the territorial states. His realm had grown in size considerably over the last two centuries to be a near rival of any of the member states. Many of the new colonists had come from the Terran hegemony, strengthening the bond between the two nations. But Amaris routinely misappropriated these cash injections, pumping them into his covert arms acquisitions. Furthermore, a significant percentage of the funding actually came from a slew of new business connections the Rimworld's president had made within the Terran hegemony. Without explaining its purpose, Amaris had borrowed great sums from several Innisphere corporations who were eager to partner with a realm that was on the up and up, seeking to reclaim those loan payments tenfold in future trade deals. Amaris had made himself a regular at court by befriending the young First Lord. As his influence grew, Many powerful individuals from within the hegemony found it prudent to align themselves with the only man who seemed to have Cameron's ear. Over time, these business relationships strengthened ties between the Rimworlds and Terra. Even the common citizens saw them as brethren, unlike the other periphery realms. By 2765, Amaris had firmly ingratiated himself within the League's nobility. At the head of this informal alliance was the powerful businesswoman and fashionista, Ashling Connor. Though their association was in its early days, Ashling would in time become another of Stefan's inner circle elite. While most of the funding and materiel had come from Amaris, the army itself was staffed almost exclusively by natives of the other periphery realms. Most remained unaware of the source of their new equipment. On that note, the vast majority of the mechs and armor within the force were relics of the Age of War and were well below the standard of the late Star League. Furthermore, the army had no proper training or cohesion, nor a supply chain to keep them operational. Despite the raw numbers suggesting they could topple any of the member states save the hegemony, in truth they were closer to a very heavily armed mob, and their performance suffered duly. Last but not least of the Star League militaries was the Rimworld's army. The RWA was a relative unknown to the SLDF, but what they did know gave them serious concerns. While Stefan Amaris appeared loyal, there was no assurance that his descendants would be equally pro Star League, especially if the expected periphery uprising went poorly. After the Draconis Combine, the Rimworlds appeared to be the next most likely to start a war, with which of its three neighbours though remained unknown. The RWA ended the reunification war with just two combined arms regiments, the Amaris Republican Guard and the 4th Amaris Dragoons. The first Amaris Armoured had also escaped destruction during Operation Mailed Fist by dividing themselves among the many planetary militias and refusing to fight, thereby going unnoticed. A quartet of warships, three of which had been stuck in dry dock throughout the 20 year war, had survived as well. As previously covered, they steadily expanded up to a combined 40 regiments by 2752, but with the lifting of Directive 30, those numbers shot up over the next decade. The Rimworld's army demonstrated a level of professionalism and loyalty that would rival any of its contemporaries or our modern equivalents. 
the Amaris family had spent centuries building up their military schools, such as the Apollo Military Academy and Finnmark Air and Space Academy, to match any from within the inner sphere. These troops were then equipped with the best machines the Rim Worlds could manufacture or Amaris could swindle from the Terran hegemony. It's no wonder that post-war, the member states did what they could to recruit them for themselves. While Amaris's secret army was largely stocked with hand-me-downs and cast-offs, the RWA was very well equipped, with some of the elite units fielding designs otherwise exclusive to the SLDF Royal Regiments. The Star League Intelligence Corps suspected these were acquired through his close friendship with Richard Cameron, but the truth was that Stefan had become such a staple within the Terran hegemony that he had forged many close alliances with other powerful individuals within the realm. They looked to him as an intermediary for dealing with the unreasonable First Lord. The Rimworld's army had a fanatical loyalty on par with even the Draconis Combine. Many were inspired by the propaganda machine and heroic individuals from the Third Hidden War, such as Colonel Zat Darg of the 4th Amaris Dragoons, who now taught at the Apollo Military Academy. Commandant of that institution was General Jasmine Amaris, the former head of the RWA, and she used this position to ensure the loyalty of her future officers. This was the public reason for their strong patriotism but there was a more insidious reason behind the scenes. Colloquially known as the Terra, the Rimworlds had a number of institutions working in unison to assure loyalty. The first was the political officers scattered throughout the regimental command staff of the RWA. They ensured that no one within the army ever acted in a manner that was against the best interests of the Amaris family. Their civilian counterparts were the Kryptia, a secret society who kept watch over the actions of everyday Rimworlders and reported any non-conformity up the chain of command. Those individuals in question might later receive a polite word or disappear altogether. The Amaris Republican Guard that at one time had fought alongside the Star League in the Reunification War now formed the first of 26 mech regiments within the new Republican Guard Brigade. These were partnered with 28 mechanized infantry regiments and together formed into six divisions. This near SLDF organizational structure was used across the RWA. The Amaris regulars were the largest brigade, an amalgamation of the fusiliers and armored. They now fielded eight divisions, mostly concentrated around Apollo. The Amaris lancers were the more provincial equivalents and had six divisions of their own. Between them, they counted another 56 battle mech and 70 mechanized infantry regiments. The Imperial divisions were the elite of the RWA. Named for military heroes of the Republic's history, they counted among their ranks the most fanatical, piloting the most advanced mechs. The Stefan Amaris Division was located on Apollo, Catherine Dormax on Finnmark, Hector Rowe on Timbuktu, and Tadio Amaris on Erdvin. Each division had four brigades total, two battle mech, one infantry, and one armor. The Rimwells was also the largest employer of mercenaries by an order of magnitude. In 2765, they had approximately eight whole divisions worth, though mostly in small groups, few of which had the ability to fight in larger formations. Granted unofficial control of this loose assortment of units, and commander of his own mercenary regiment, was General Antilos Legos. Legos was the polar opposite of Patrick Scoffins, callous, not principled, but pragmatic, not fanatic. Much to General Scoffins' annoyance, he was also one of Amaris's inner circle, trusted with the jobs the Honorable RWA Commander might object to. In total, excluding the ragtag mercenaries, the RWA fielded 95 battle mech and 115 mechanized infantry regiments, positioning themselves as by far the strongest power in the periphery. That strength carried over into their navy. By 2750 they had operated a small fleet of 18 warships, but Salanta Amaris's foresight a century prior proved fortuitous once the restrictions were removed and they brought back into service the 30 mothballed Pintos, and continued to grow over the next decade into the largest fleet outside the SLDF. By 2765, they now operated 52 of those vessels, 32 Bonaventure and 30 Vigilant Corvettes, an advanced tracker surveillance warship, 65 Riga frigates, 40 Essex, 21 Lola and 18 Carson destroyers, 7 Dart light cruisers, and 7 Monsoon battleships. Most of these vessels were sourced from none other than the SLDF reserve fleet. In this time of crisis, Amaris had convinced the First Lord to hand over the more serviceable vessels, promising to foot the bill in terms of operating cost, something which Richard did gladly. All of these totaled a dizzying 273 warships within the RWA, 
but even this wasn't the end of it. At the head of this vast armada was the crown jewel of the Rimwald's navy, a trio of brand new Stefan Amaris class battleships. Commanding the flagship of the same name and the RWN at large was Admiral Geoffrey Coultier. Amaris had recently acquired rights to fit these craft with the advanced lithium fusion batteries that would allow them to jump twice before recharging, and to complete that work, they, along with the rest of the Rimworld's navy, were on their way to Earth. Thank you so much for watching guys, it was a numbers heavy episode but I hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you want to support the channel, the best thing you can do is share the video around. It's the number one thing the YouTube algorithm looks at. If they see people coming from outside of the platform and then spending time here, potentially clicking on other videos as well, they love that and they like to promote the video more in the hopes that it will encourage other people to share it too. If you wish to support it more directly, I do have a Patreon link down in the description but I do really appreciate everyone who takes the time to leave a comment or a like on the video. I always try to respond to as many as I can. Just as I ended last time, I want to thank everyone who volunteered their time to contribute to this project. That's Wargamer Fritz, Death From Above Wargaming, Your Seat At The Table, Camo Specs, and Battlebound. Some of these channels I've been watching for years, others I've just discovered more recently, but they all make quality Battletech content. So uh, I'm leaving a link in the description below. I encourage you all to check them out. I will be back in two weeks time for chapter three. It is already finished and will be going live on October 29th. But if you can't wait till then, I'm going to have a bonus episode coming out next weekend on the 22nd. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again on another video.